Hello again, this is Matthew Zachary. Welcome you to today's special bonus episode of Out of Patience featuring episode two of the BCSM podcast. Enjoy. This episode of the BCSM podcast was made possible with support from Daiichi Sankyo and Sijen. Welcome back to the BCSM podcast. Last time, we heard the story of how Alicia Staley and Jody Shoger built an amazing online community of clinicians and researchers and advocates. In this episode, we're going to meet some of those advocates and hear their voices and their stories on how they found BCSM and utilized it to further their advocacy within the healthcare space. I was just minding my own business, trying to be alive in this world. That's Lisa Bernstein, patient advocate and consultant. Lisa had three separate diagnoses of breast cancer. The first at 29 in 1994. My year started off with a literal bang, and then it went downhill from there. Back in ye old days of 94, the buzzword for patients at the time was support groups. We must get you into a support group. You know, I tried two in-person support groups and ran away screaming and crying for both of them. They were horrible for me, um, traumatic experiences, because I was the youngest person in the room by, you know, decades, and just could not identify with what was going on and what people were talking about, and it just wasn't right for me. Lisa had tried online communities back in 2001, but they weren't the right fit for her either. I found a message board where people were talking about breast cancer, and what I ended up realizing was it was quite similar to the in-person experiences, and it was just a lot of venting and moaning and groaning, and believe me, I've done and still do my share of that. It's really important to be able to vent, but it just wasn't what I needed. Then, in 2005, Lisa got her second diagnosis. My brand new radiation oncologist, she kept on talking to me about the support group that they were running at this cancer center, and I kept saying to her, no, not going to go. I don't like support groups. She said, you know, we do them once a month. I co-moderate them with our oncology specialized social worker. I think you would get a lot out of coming. And, you know, I was like, okay, fine. Twist my arm. I'll go once when I'm done with radiation. I'm someone who's always been incredibly curious and asking a bazillion questions and wanting to know the latest research. And I think that what she had in her mind was that by my going, it would not only benefit me, but my presence there might help others. I think she saw in me the advocate perhaps that I was going to become without us talking about it in terms of advocacy. Lisa went to the in-person support group. It was the first time she attended a support group that welcomed researchers and doctors. Although it was informative, she eventually stopped going. In 2009, Lisa got her third diagnosis. Over the years, I'd been hearing about SABCS, the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, which happens every December. So in 2010, I was recovering from my hopefully you know, final breast cancer surgery. And so I was sitting at my kitchen table following the tweets from the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. And that is when I realized the incredible power of Twitter to connect people who were interested in breast cancer, people who were both patients, survivors, you know, researchers, and doctors. And it was my entryway into this whole world of breast cancer Twitter. So I quickly found HICSM, which is HCSM, the healthcare social media tweet chat that was started by Dana Lewis. Very quickly, I started to see there were some people whose names kept on coming up and who were tweeting things that made a lot of sense and that were really interesting. And two of those people were, of course, Jody Shogar and Alicia Staley. Lisa began to immerse herself in the world of breast cancer and healthcare innovation. She began to cross paths with Alicia and Jody. When Jody and Alicia started BCSM, it was totally natural for me to want to join them there because I'd already seen the power of the way we could communicate and support each other and share information and even already collaborate using Twitter. You know, the pre-BCSM and the BCSM community, you know, over those months completely helped me find my voice and begin to realize that I really did have something to offer. In the last episode of BCSM, we talked about Jody Shoger, co-moderator of BCSM. 
Jody was a mentor to many members within BCSM, including Lisa. Lisa recalls meeting Jody in person for the first time at the Stanford Medicine X conference. With all of this common interest that we had in, in healthcare innovation and being these sort of accidental advocates, we started finding out about these conferences that were taking place, one of which was Stanford Medicine X. And I applied to go, Jody applied, and a bunch of other people applied. And once we found out we were accepted, Jody had encouraged me along the way because I was still, like I said before, quite timid. But I applied and it got accepted. And then it was like, oh my God, how am I going to get there? And when I get there, how, where am I going to stay? Because I was cancer broke. You know, if you've ever heard of financial toxicity. So Jody and I, you know, we were still direct messaging. And she said, well, you know, if you can find the funds, you can share my hotel room with me. And that was just, you know, we only know each other from Twitter and I'm going to share a hotel room with you. Oh my God, you, you've offered me that? We decided to get on the phone and I remember I said, so you're not an axe murderer, are you? <laughs> we both laughed. And <laughs> so the first time I met Jody was in Palo Alto and we shared a hotel room. Lisa met Alicia in person for the first time at Medicine X the following year. I have met so many people around the world, both in person and online, and developed the most incredible friendships and, and found you know, my place in the world through BCSM. BCSM has been fundamental to my life. And I often talk about, you know, for many people who've had cancer, particularly people who've had it only once, um, <laughs> there's a sort of life before and after cancer. But for me, it was like, well, life before and after the first one, but then, oh, the second and then the third. So for me, it's really life before and after Twitter, because finding all of these incredible people through this community has been life changing for me. It was a very lengthy process for me to get diagnosed. It started in the beginning of April. I didn't have a diagnosis until the end of July. That's Anne-Marie Mercurio, patient advocate and writer. Anne-Marie was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2006. In that period of time, there was not much online that I considered reliable in 2006 and 2007 when I was making treatment decisions. In 2011, Anne-Marie got involved in breast cancer conversations online. She started a blog called Chemo Brain in the Fog, where she writes about how chemotherapy may have saved her life, but it scrambled her brain. I get through treatment, realize that the chemotherapy scrambled my brains, and I go looking for help again and enter BCSM, and all of a sudden this whole world had opened up. I was watching Twitter one night and there was a fascinating discussion going on that launched me into a situation where, first of all, I found my tribe, which, as we all know, no matter where you are in the trajectory of cancer, you still need to feel like you're supported. The reliability and the quality of the information that I knew I was getting was supremely important to me. And the support of people that were either inactive treatment, post-treatment, living with metastatic disease, just the sense of community surrounding each and every person. Everyone is respectful of one another. Like many in the community, Anne-Marie began using the BCSM chats as a resource for her own ongoing cancer journey. I had a situation pop up in 2011, 2012, where I had to go for tests the following day. And, you know, 3.30 in the morning, I'm sitting on the side of my bed, flipping out. I can't sleep. I am a nervous wreck because we all know that once you're told cancer, everything that goes on in your life, you automatically presume it's the cancer again. And I just remember sending a tweet and using the hashtag and, you know, can't sleep, freaking out, you know, and someone from Australia tweeted back to me and I'm like, I can sleep now. I was heard. Someone heard me. 
Anne-Marie even used the BCSM chats to help her mother, a long-term metastatic breast cancer survivor. I was at major cancer center with my mom getting a biopsy to see if the disease had spread to her bone. All day long, I had been, you know, joking around with my siblings on a, you know, a, a group text. And I get this news and I'm like, well, what now what am I supposed to do? I can't text this to my brothers and sisters, aunts and whoever else. And I turned to Twitter and I remember sending out a tweet. We have another hashtag that we use, fearless friends. And I remember sending that out onto Twitter like I was not supposed to be a fearless friend for my mom. And I'm walking in circles with nowhere to turn. And the outpouring of support that came at me, not only from other patients, like, you know, people that whose shoes I walk in, but doctors that were reaching out to me and researchers that were reaching out to me that were part of the Twitter community that were, you know, using that hashtag. For Anne-Marie, BCSM became a lifeline. I was probably spending a few too many hours a day on Twitter, but I will say that at that point in my life, that's what I needed to be doing because that was what enabled me to finally put the trauma of the whole thing behind me and start building toward what can I be doing to help others that are 10 steps behind me by following in the footsteps of those that are 10 steps ahead of me. Researchers began to observe BCSM's conversations, reaching out to advocates like Anne-Marie. Researchers have sent me a direct message on Twitter that they're trying to put together something within the clinical trial realm, and they want to layer it with patient-reported outcomes, but they want to make sure that they're capturing what's important to patients. So I think that trials are being designed now with that at the forefront, because look, let's face it, if we can't accrue to trials quickly and we're not capturing data that's going to matter to patients, then how successful is the trial? The trial is not only to just advance the science, but for the betterment of the population that you're trying to you know, research within. By marrying those two things and making sure that there's a buy-in from both sides, it just becomes really a winning situation all the way around because you're getting better quality out of the trials because you're asking the questions that you see are concerning to not just one patient, but there's a large discussion taking place about a particular side effect that's troubling to a group of patients. I think that anybody that's looking to design a trial should be looking through keywords and hashtags and and all of those things to see what, what discussions are taking place about this particular therapy that I want to develop a trial around so that we can make it the best possible design and give back the most robust information. Anne-Marie began to decipher technical language so that patients could understand it. I would take the time to kind of make sure that I was acting as a translator. When they're talking about these, you know, crazy scientific terms, I would be like, let me take a breath and let me make sure that the potential impact of what what is being shared by the researchers is understood by the people that are ultimately going to benefit from it. That, I think, put me in a position where I'm like, you know what, this is kind of cool to be able to do this. I'm able to speak the science language a little bit, and I'm able to speak the patient language an awful lot. And how do I marry those two? Anne-Marie's unique ability to speak both doctor and patient at the same time led her to speaking at grant review panels. She saw a unique opportunity to break through the jargon and make clear the value of cancer patients. It's like, make it count. This is not about you. It's about making a point on behalf of the community. And if you make this point well, then they're going to realize the value of having the voice of someone that's got the lived experience to kind of turn the whole paradigm on its head and, and really make it stick so that Others can be, you know, and I'm certainly not the only one that's doing this. There are many of us, but there are not many of us in high enough places. And then to have the the other side, the people that are actually designing these things say, 
you know, that's a good point. And suddenly I'm getting phone calls. Will you come and speak to our group and come sit with us while we're designing the the grant proposal that we want to do to make sure that we're capturing as much relevant information that's going to help the patients at the end of the day. That is so satisfying and so rewarding. And that would never have happened if not for, you know, what started as a tweet chat that built into this like ginormous global community. It was there for me weekly for years. Now I find myself, you know, okay, I can make a difference on a much larger scale by participating with different groups of people where I can, I could be bringing the voices of the community that I learned so much from and bringing that forward. My dad was diagnosed six years before my own diagnosis, de novo metastatic, a rare type of cancer. That was where I first learned to become an advocate. That's Christine Hodgson, patient advocate and co-founder of GRASP. Christine's path to advocacy began long before her own diagnosis. I learned that it was absolutely necessary to advocate for a patient who was struggling with pain or had anxiety or stress around that diagnosis. And it was important to have somebody outside of that to advocate. What was very unique about his case is that, you know, it was so rare that there was really no options for him. I never found another patient with rhabdomyosarcoma. There was no community around that. There was no treatment options. There were no trials. There weren't even doctors who really knew how to study this in um, an adult. It's a typically diagnosed in patients under five. So I'm pretty sure we had a pediatric oncologist, which was just very strange. Christine was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015. Her breast cancer diagnosis was clearly much different from her father's. Breast cancer is you know, much more common. There's a lot of awareness about breast cancer. While I was getting this metastatic diagnosis, I felt, you know, sad about that, but actually quite lucky that there was so much more attention to my particular type of disease. You know, I was always able to kind of compare my situation to my father's and feel very grateful that there were resources, there was a community, but, you know, it was still hard to kind of tap into as a metastatic patient being 34 years old, young, never married, never had children. It was, it was hard to find other people like me that kind of had my same experience. So I was very alone for the first couple of years. I worked full time through all of my treatments and I really didn't get involved in advocacy for a couple of years, actually. I, I thought I was the only young metastatic patient that was stable with no evidence of disease. That's what I thought. I thought all the other metastatic patients died. In 2015, Christine attended the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, which she had heard about from a friend. Everybody that I know who is my friend now in advocacy, I met at San Antonio. Inadvertently, BCSM, it was my introduction into the patient advocacy community. I just wanted to learn more about my particular subtype of breast cancer, but it was there that I met all these other advocates who knew each other through the BCSM community. And they welcomed me with open arms. I mean, I really was so shocked that there were other people with metastatic breast cancer, living full lives, stable, you know, some maybe were dealing with progression here and there, but it was still quite amazing to me to see, oh, these people aren't that different from me. And, you know, I was able to meet young people, really young people, I think what I learned there was how much I didn't know. That was where I realized that, wow, there's some really savvy advocates here. They really know their stuff. And I felt totally inadequate, you know, not in a bad way because they were so welcoming. Christine found what she was missing, a community connected through shared experience. I mean, I really felt alone for those first couple of years. You know, nobody really got me. Everybody thought I was cured because I had no evidence of disease, but, you know, I still have a port in my chest and I get infusions every three weeks. So, you know, my family was just, everybody was very grateful that I was okay, but nobody got it. Nobody really got what I was going through. I mean, I I basically had to decide not to have children. You know, I had to make these like really big decisions and I was just totally by myself. Christine began observing the BCSM conversations that were taking place online. 
Nobody knows that you're there lurking. <laughs> and that's totally my style. I'm much more like behind the scenes. It was just a nice way to, to kind of ease into the advocacy community. I am infrequent with my posts and I don't talk that much about my uh, disease status or stability or non-stability. I'm more private that way. But there is this utility in, you know, being able to have that platform and it's accessible. And, you know, it really kind of helps both the extrovert and the introvert. And lurking in this case is not creepy. This is actually, it's almost encouraged. We want you to see the conversations that are happening. We want people to hear other patients maybe going through a similar experience. So lurk away. It's exactly how I started. In 2018, Christine met Julia Mawis, fellow advocate and co-founder of GRASP. Julia was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2013 while pregnant with her son. I could not do scans that would check the status of the disease outside my breast. So I could do ultrasounds and uh, they did the biopsy. I knew I had breast cancer. I knew I, I needed to receive treatment for the breast cancer during the pregnancy. As soon as I delivered my son and could do scans I couldn't do while pregnant, we discovered that the cancer was already metastatic. Julia was treated soon after in an attempt to keep her alive. For a few months there, it wasn't really sure that I would live uh, for very long because I had major heart problems. So I think like at least the first year or so was how many months will I live? Um, and I was only in the survival mode. And then I also had a new baby. And so I never had time to think about advocacy. Amidst all her health complications, Julia was still working as an economist for the Federal Reserve. I had a career and that was good and distracted me from all the health problems. I had some time during my career where I had supportive bosses and an environment that was supportive that eventually changed and really went in the opposite direction. And I was also dealing with some progression so I eventually left my career and tried to focus on my health. In 2016, Julia took her first steps into advocacy. My doctor asked me to speak at a fundraiser for research. And it was a private event at someone's house. And I did just tell my story, which I realize is very shocking. I mean, diagnosed during pregnancy received chemo, delivered a healthy baby, had mets everywhere, including the brain, etc. All these things are, they really call attention. So at the time I said, you know, if there's anything positive that can come from this terrible, terrible story, I'll do it. I'll share what happened to me if that will get people to give money to research. Absolutely. And when I did that, something changed inside of me, and I realized the power that sharing my story had. Julia began connecting with survivors online. In 2018, she attended the Living Beyond Breast Cancer Metastatic Breast Cancer Conference. It was there that she met Christine. The two joined forces, and while working together as advocates, they quickly noticed a missing link. What we started to see was just this lack of collaboration between advocates and researchers. Julia was very good at sort of making the connections to researchers. I have a science background, so I enjoy helping people find trials and find drugs and treatments that might work for them. But you really need both. It's not just me talking about a trial is, you know, that's informative maybe, but you really need a, an oncologist to back that up. Christine and Julia combined their strengths and founded GRASP an acronym for Guiding Researchers and Advocates to Scientific Partnerships. GRASP launched at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium in December 2019. What we're really focused on is just breaking down that barrier that often exists between patients and researchers. And BCSM was already doing that. It was already breaking down these barriers where it allowed for conversations to happen that, you know, weren't in the context of like an academic conference. These were like after hours conversations and very candid and very honest. And I think that that helped us see that this is possible. <laughs> the scientists and the researchers and clinicians aren't, you know, aliens. They are people who, you know, have 
children and have lives and can actually almost be your friend, you know, and or maybe even better, like a colleague is how I see them. According to Christine, once they realized that connecting advocates and researchers was possible, GRASP was welcomed into the community. You know, I think a lot of people start projects, they have to promote their business or promote their program to say like, look how great this is, you know, you should participate. We had the opposite. We had such a need to bring these two groups together that we don't have to promote it. We actually have the opposite problem where we have so many people interested, it's kind of hard for us to keep up with the work. GRASP started at an ASCO conference last year. And it was just a poster walkthrough with me and uh, another scientist, cancer researcher, and we both learned a lot from each other and, and we tweeted about it and people started commenting, where can I sign up for that program? <laughs> it wasn't about having to promote it and get people involved. It was so easy. And we thought that we'd have no problem with advocates. We were a little bit worried about scientists but actually they have responded wonderfully. And so that's the unique part about GRASS and that there is such a need to bring these groups together. And, and our whole mission is to drive better research. We think that when you have advocates involved in the research process and early, not I wrote a whole grant, I want you to give me a letter of approval. No, at the very beginning where the patients are actually helping design a trial, for example, or to you know refine the outcomes of a study that's where we think we feel that we can actually drive better research but what we realize is there is no real formal way for researchers and advocates to meet and so we just want to create more opportunities to do that for julia it's crucial for researchers doctors and clinicians to recognize that patients are experts in living with cancer my doctor has decades of experience. She's treated probably thousands of people. She's led national trials. But thankfully, she hasn't personally had cancer impact her own life. And she hasn't felt the chemotherapy coming through her veins or have to figure out how to manage uh, child care and going to infusion every three weeks or how to get scans and scan results or things like that. And yes, there are doctors who have had that personal experience. And those are very unique stories that have to definitely be told. But the patient in general is not the physician, is not in the medical field. And that person's story needs to be elevated, needs to be shared. We are a key player in the whole system. We need to not be an afterthought. We need to not be a end user period of the product. We need to be included early on because our preferences matter when it comes to designing trials, when it comes to deciding how healthcare will be delivered, when it comes to making decisions that will ultimately impact our lives more than anyone else's. And I think that whole idea of patients as experts has really grown over the last few years. With GRASP, we have taken that to the poster sessions and to the science discussions where you have a, a brainstorming with the key players and you have the clinician and you have the researcher and you have the patient. Maybe you have the pharmaceutical company. Those are all players that could possibly be involved, but the patient has to be involved from the beginning. And I think that is something that GRASP has played a role in. Our hope is, is that GRASP is not us, right? We may have started it, the ideas uh, may have come from us, but we need people to take on and, and do the work because our ultimate focus as metastatic patients is to stay alive. Lisa, Anne-Marie, Christine, and Julia are just some of the thousands of breast cancer survivors who have found community, support, education, and furthered their own advocacy through the power of BCSM. Stay tuned for the next and final episode of BCSM 
where we're going to take a deep dive into systemic racial disparities in healthcare and its impact on the breast cancer community. Thank you for listening to this episode of the BCSM podcast. If you like the series, be sure to subscribe, leave a rating, a review, share on social media, and please tell your community to check it out. Your voice matters, and we'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback about this series. So call us at 855-AUDIO-66, that's 855-283-4666, and leave us a good old-fashioned voicemail with your comments. We can't wait to hear from you. And don't forget to join the BCSM Weekly Tweet Chat live every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern on Twitter. The BCSM Podcast is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producers are Brianna Seeley and me, Matthew Zachary. Our contributing producers are Alicia Staley and Dr. Deanna Atai. Andrew McDowell is our senior producer. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Brianna Seeley. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscriptnot.com. No